Okay, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon and greetings from Vilnius. I am uh, Ramunas Vilpeshauskas, Jean Monnet Chair Professor at the Institute of International Relations and Political Science of Vilnius University. And I'm very happy to be moderating this panel on European neighborhood pol uh, policy, uh, which has uh, great speakers that I will introduce in a moment. Um, the exact title of uh, this panel is what is the temperature of the European neighborhood policy, which to me uh, sounds like a medical term, probably appropriate in these uh, difficult times. Uh, uh, it also points to the need for first of all, diagnosis of the situation in uh, those countries that comprise Eastern neighborhood, uh, Belarus, Moldova, uh, were mentioned uh, in the conference program. Uh, one could add also Georgia with recent political events, uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, especially having in mind what happened several months ago in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, and also Ukraine is always on our minds uh, with uh, those reforms that uh, seem either as glass full or glass half full or glass half empty, depending on the perspective. And we also have Southern neighborhood, uh, uh, Middle East and uh, Northern African countries. They were also mentioned in the conference program. Uh, so quite a lot of in terms of geography. Uh, and different issues to be discussed. Uh, uh, and I'm sure that our panelists uh, will uh, choose which countries and topics they see as the most important to be discussed today. What is the temperature according to their point of view and what medicine could be prescribed either by domestic doctors or external <laughs> doctors if we continue with these metaphors uh, since EU is also an external actor here uh, viewed probably differently in different countries with different aspirations as witnessed by a lot of EU flags in 2014 in Kiev and not so many flags last year in Minsk. So there are different uh, situations in different countries uh, which call for different approaches of the EU and its member states. Um, so once again, I would like, uh, would like to welcome everybody, uh, speakers and uh, those in the audience to the panel on European neighborhood policy, which is part of the Baltic EU conversations conference, the sixth uh, conference, which takes part this year uh, and debates uh, the most important issues on the EU agenda seen from the Baltic perspective and broader regional perspective. Uh, let me introduce our excellent uh, panelists. We have representatives of both policymaking community and think tank community. Uh, and we will uh, go this in the same order as it is indicated in the program, starting with uh, Mr. Arnoldas Pranskevicius, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania. I could also call him European Minister of Lithuania, since that's uh, his main responsibility, his portfolio. Uh, we also have uh, Ms. Lolita Chigane who is a former uh, chair of the European Affairs Committee of the Parliament of Latvia, uh, participant of these uh, Baltic EU conversations before, so she is not new uh, to this event, and, and I'm very happy to, to see her uh, again in this uh, uh, new capacity of a former <laughs> MP of Latvia, uh, and we also have uh, Arkady Moshes, uh, who is a director of EU's Eastern Neighborhood and Russia Research Program at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. A uh, very experienced uh, analyst uh, who has been working for a long time on 
uh, our region on Russia, on, on Eastern neighbors of the EU and has impressive expertise on these issues. Uh, so I am also very uh, much looking forward to, to hear his uh, views on the current situation. Unfortunately, uh, Joanna Rosa from the European Council of Foreign uh, Relations is not with us today. Uh, we just found out yesterday that she got sick and is not able to join us for this talk, but uh, well, I hope she will recover soon, but the positive side of this uh, is that our three panelists uh, have a bit more time to present their views in their introductory remarks. So I suggest uh, to limit your remarks to 10, 12 minutes. And then we will uh, have a discussion, uh, Q&A, Hopefully there will be questions from the audience uh, and uh, I would like to remind uh, a, a technical note related to uh, this. There are two ways to ask uh, questions. One is by using uh, the function of virtual hand in, in this uh, Zoom platform. The other one, especially for those from the outside who are watching on internet is to use uh, Slido application uh, to send uh, your questions and I will be happy to read them to our panelists. Uh, so I think these are all the household rules that I had to present. And uh, now let's move to the introductory remarks uh, and start with uh, Arnoldas Pranskevichus, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania. Arnoldas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ramune, and, and thank you so much uh, uh, to the organizers of this conference for the invitation. It's wonderful to be back at the Baltic EU Conversations. It's really an excellent uh, uh, conference. Unfortunately, we meet virtually, but these are the days and the times. Let's hope that next year in Riga, we will be already seeing each other physically. And indeed, uh, you know, the topic of our panel discussion uh, would perhaps attract the attention of skeptics saying, well, this is really not the time, right, to talk about the neighborhood when uh, the European Union, Europe at large is facing so many problems from fighting COVID-19 to the vaccination strategy, to of course, uh, you know, recovery uh, strategy and, and, and recovery fund. Uh, to you know, managing the global affairs, uh, starting uh, with the engagement uh, with the new Joe Biden administration across the Atlantic, to of course uh, 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 you know dealing with China, to containing Russia and whatnot. But of course, to those skeptics, one could say that you know uh, if now is not the time, when is the time? Because Europe is always in crisis. Europe is a union of crises. I mean, you know, we know all the famous Jean Monnet saying that Europe is born in crisis, that Europe is going from crisis to crisis without, without losing enthusiasm. And in fact, uh, uh, especially the neighborhood is, is uh, where it is most tested uh, and where even in terms of COVID-19 and vaccination, its uh, uh, engagement is much needed, uh, much needed and, 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 and will be much welcome. So uh, in, in this period, I think uh, we should also remind ourselves of the very purpose of European neighborhood policy. And remember the good old Javier Solana and his advisor, Robert Cooper, and the origins of this policy, which were in many ways uh, uh, based on the internal uh, self-interest of Europe uh, and very much not only economic, but also security. You, you might remember this, this, this famous saying that in order not to import instability, from both South and East, we should, as European Union, uh, try to export stability, peace, uh, and uh, predictability uh, to our immediate neighborhood. Uh, we should also recall and remind ourselves that when we are dealing with the global um, challenges and, and trying now, especially to engage with the United States administration and whatnot, uh, we should remember that our foreign policy as such is mostly tested and its credibility is tested in its neighborhood. If the European Union is not able to tackle the problems next doors, how can it aspire to be a global player uh, and uh, an important partner in transatlantic relations and, and further afield? 
so in this context, uh, in answering your question, what is the temperature um, in the, the neighborhood policy? I will concentrate on the Eastern Partnership, naturally, because for Lithuania, that's a very important uh, uh, policy where Lithuania is acting very actively and, and is one of the most enthusiastic members uh, of this um, policy. Arnoldas, I'm sorry, something is with the connection. Uh, we lost your sound. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you look at the temperature in the region itself, it's quite high and hot. We have uh, uh, frozen conflicts in all uh, countries of Eastern Partnership, except for Belarus. And even in Belarus, we we're heading to perhaps a perpetual crisis, you know, uh, more than now, uh, seven months after the beginning of the protests, uh, after the rigged elections of Alexander Lukashenko. So we have issues and crises of different extent in all uh, Eastern Partnership countries. We have Russia as a player um, behind most of those conflicts, most of those crises, and most of those uh, flare-ups. You've mentioned the, uh, the recent uh, uh, war in uh, over Nagorno-Karabakh. You mentioned the recent political tensions in Georgia. And in Armenia, uh, we are all aware of uh, still a very much uh, difficult path towards reform and transformation in Ukraine and in Moldova, especially where the situation remains very fragile. Uh, so, you know, uh, the stakes couldn't be higher, the temperature couldn't be higher, whilst in the EU itself, you know, uh, the temperature over the Eastern Partnership is very cold. We have freezing temperatures, um, especially if you go further uh, west from um, Vilnius, Riga, Warsaw, and other capitals, the level of disinterest and uh, the level of fatigue over Eastern Partnership is becoming alarming. Um, and uh, it is becoming very difficult to infuse the member states uh, to be more engaged and more interesting, interested in the region um, and uh, to be more politically active. And here I think, you know, um, the, the purpose of those who believe in Eastern Partnership should be to try to reverse this type of uh, discussion. We should really try to, to fight this defeatism, pessimism, and uh, negativity towards, uh, towards this policy. Uh, on the one hand, by admitting the successes, which are undeniable, and we often forget that despite all efforts by Russia to torpedo and stop by all costs, uh, the signature and ratification of association agreements and deep and comprehensive free trade areas with Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, those plans did not materialize of Russia. Those agreements were signed and ratified and fully enforced. With all three countries, we have visa-free regimes, which uh, have been uh, an incredibly important concrete deliverable symbolically as well to the citizens of those countries, a huge victory and success uh, for the nations uh, of uh, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova. We've managed to become more flexible in our policy by signing the, the uh, comprehensive and enhanced partnership agreement with Armenia, which uh, just entered into force um, a couple of weeks ago uh, and, uh, and uh, is an example of, uh, of a stronger relationship with the country, which at the same time is in the Eurasian Union and in the customs union with Russia. Uh, we have uh, mobilized incredible level of support financially, politically, in terms of expertise, not only to Ukraine, but also to Georgia and, and to Moldova. Um, and uh, so, you know, there are many things which we can be proud of, but that is of course not enough uh, to, uh, on the one hand, focus uh, our partners on reform path, and on the other hand, uh, uh, as well, uh, uh, to show the concrete deliverables of this policy to the citizens of both partner countries and of the EU member states. And here, of course, if you look at the 20, Concrete deliverables, they do, you know, uh, suggest quite a few useful ideas, you know, from, from, from roaming prices to, to uh, for opportunities in, in education uh, and student exchange uh, to, of course, investments in road and infrastructure through connecting your facility. All of that is very good. Lithuania wouldn't be Lithuania if it wouldn't w wish to go a bit further and being even more ambitious. You know, we would like to see even stronger uh, and more ambitious proposal to our Eastern partners on the table. And that could be 
for instance, access to single market, uh, especially as we, as we approach uh, the Eastern Partnership Summit later this year, where we would like to have some concrete and tangible deliverables. This could be a long-term goal um, uh, in order to really uh, focus the minds uh, of our partners uh, on the reforms that they need to do at home. Um, a bit in the line of Romano Prodi's famous uh, approach of everything but institutions, right? Really to, to offer as many possibilities in EU single market as possible, given that conditions are met, without, of course, uh, joining uh, um, uh, the, the institutions, as this is not yet uh, uh, the, the debate uh, on the table. Um, and as we approach the summit, uh, uh, we should also perhaps look at the very useful uh, study which was just commissioned uh, by the Center for European Policy Studies, Michael Emerson, which tried to compare the reform pro uh, progress in Western Balkan countries and in Eastern partners. And there isn't much difference in terms of speed and depth of reforms if you compare Montenegro, Serbia, North Macedonia on the one hand, and Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine on the other. So here, I think what one should invite a bit more of consistency of the European Union, how it rewards those reforms, how it uh, uh, rethinks its uh, toolkit in terms of motivational uh, uh, carrots, um, as really uh, there are uh, 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 you know countries which I believe uh, we should uh, we should uh, reward much more, uh, given that they they uh, um, you know they they commit to very difficult transformation. And I will end here, Ramune, by saying that despite the, the fact that perhaps um, single market, digital, and climate, and other areas might be uh, tan very tangible for the governments and the citizens, uh, we shouldn't forget that for us as the European Union, it's very important also to continue um, in a very patient way uh, in pushing the democratic reforms in our partner countries. The recent events in Georgia, especially, and in Armenia show that uh, it's very, very, very fragile. Uh, the political systems are still very fragile. They are, uh, you know, uh, in, in many ways uh, still uh, um, in developing phase. And therefore, uh, what we need is uh, uh, accountable, democratic, functioning um, institutions. R reminding ourselves of another very famous quote of Jean Monnet, that nothing is possible without individuals, uh, but nothing is lasting without institutions. And by institutions, I mean overall the functioning democratic state, courts and media, and check and balances system, um, and uh, accountability and independence uh, of, of, of different public institutions. Here, we need a lot of strategic patience. Here, we need decades of work. Here, we need a lot of good practice sharing between the member states and Eastern partners. And, uh, and I think that also should be one of the key areas to focus on. Thank you, Ramone. Thank you very much, Arnaldi, for uh, quite concrete uh, uh, insights, uh, also for sticking to 10 minutes uh, uh, limit. Uh, when you were talking about and, and quoting uh, 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 about institutions uh, and and people i also remembered a quote attributed to one of uh, british prime ministers that uh, refers to events <laughs> events my dear boy events i think that was the exact uh, phrase uh, which somehow i tend to remember when i think about what happened uh, in minsk uh, last summer and in some other places uh, uh, and thanks for uh, reminding us of the idea for single market access. This is not a new idea. It has been proposed for quite a long time. Again, the main question is probably how to implement it, uh, how to forge uh, consensus inside the EU about giving uh, single market access to those Eastern partnership countries that advance in their domestic uh, reforms, uh, having in mind that the membership perspective is not uh, on the cards uh, at the moment. Uh, so this is 
indeed the most attractive uh, uh, incentive for, for, for reforms that you can propose um, according to what, what it does and what its competences are. So I am sure we will return to those uh, thoughts uh, in our Q&A session. And now let me uh, give the floor, virtual floor to Lolita Chigane, uh, who has uh, experience as a chair of uh, European Affairs Committee in the Parliament uh, of Latvia, dealing quite a lot with uh, European neighborhood issues. So Lolita, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ramon. Uh, thank you uh, for um, thank you to uh, to the organizers for the possibility to participate in this uh, uh, very interesting panel. And it is indeed uh, so that uh, during my tenure as the chair of the European Affairs uh, Committee, of course, we had a lot of uh, um, different contexts uh, in which we uh, were working with the issues of both. Uh, EU neighborhood policy, but of course, specifically was also Eastern uh, partnership questions, because obviously uh, this is our prime interest and also uh, regionally uh, legacy wise and many other issues wise, uh, we are interested uh, and definitely having a very concrete um, interest in uh, seeing that region develop. Uh, no matter how diverse, different uh, from uh, each other countries are, and also what kind of events happen. And these events are indeed surprising. So I think it's a very important point that you made about uh, the, the, the importance of events. And this is actually where I would like to uh, start my analysis. And probably since I'm not an, uh, an official, uh, I'm an international consultant and observer of things, also working in Eastern partnership countries. I would like to say that actually, um, departing from uh, the thoughts uh, that Arnoldus mentioned, uh, that uh, in terms of the attitude towards Eastern partnership, uh, the temperatures in the European Union are freezing, are very cold. I would like to argue that they've always been like that, more or less. And uh, when it hasn't been quite quite like that, it has usually been uh, influenced by the events in terms of media cycles. Uh, when the Euro Maiden happened, of course, uh, all of a sudden European politicians were more than happy to uh, wear Ukrainian uh, national flag colors. Uh, when uh, Belarus events happened, we all of a sudden noticed what's going on there. But in general, uh, the general coldness is something that is uh, probably I wouldn't say that dominating uh, the Eastern partnership policy, but is definitely a strong leitmotiv of uh, how this policy has developed. And uh, while I was a member of Latvian parliament, it was very beautifully and in a kind of heartbroken uh, uh, way captured by a member of parliament from Moldova. And he basically said, we offered the European Union our, our love and the European Union started, uh, started examining our heart rate. So this is the approach, uh, how the EU is perceived by Eastern partnership countries. And this is generally the approach that is being applied by the EU, uh, by the essence of this whole policy of Eastern partnership, but also by the essence of how the EU thinks about its global role. And uh, in, in general, if we are looking at uh, uh, neighborhood policy and Eastern partnership, what we are seeing and uh, have always seen there is that EU is prepared to sometimes reluctantly reciprocate if there is a strong interest, an ambition, and a wish of the respective par partner to integrate. So the EU wouldn't be a very active or proactive um, uh, builder of potential alliances unless the partner is unwilling. And of course, it's the right approach because the EU has never wanted to move beyond the soft, soft power, uh, power concept and to start being a bully, a pushy uh, global uh, player that is usually the attributes that we more uh, uh, attribute to places like the United States of America. 
So in general, the partner has to really prove that they are totally in love with the EU. And then the EU says, okay, we'll start examining your heart rate. And this has always been the approach. And uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's quite surprising that some people get puzzled that there is not this uh, passionate reciprocal love. Because in general, what the EU does, it goes very technocratic. It's not political or geostrategical uh, uh, in terms of how it views its uh, 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 um, uh, neighborhood policy and specifically Eastern partnership. It's very technocratic. And of course, what happens uh, in uh, such cases, the problem is that basically what the EU has done, and I've noticed it uh, both in um, its policy towards the candidate countries in West Balkans, but also Eastern partnership countries, that in that respect, it basically accepts the facade democracies. As long as the engagement is there and all the right things are said, uh, the further technocratic process is moving on. And how we've seen, uh, um, uh, 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 we already mentioned this uh, uh, concept of permanent crisis. And we have seen that basically what permits the EU to roll through these crises constantly is internal technocratic process. There is an internal technocratic, uh, technocratic process of permanent integration. So basically the same wheel of permanent integration or permanent uh, work and harmonization is also set in action when it comes to Eastern partnership countries, when it comes to association agreements. And this basically keeps the wheel rolling. And it's very good that it keeps the wheel rolling because we have some progress. And I think that Arnold has actually pointed that out very appropriately. There is no way that we can say that the Eastern partnership uh, policy is a failure. It's not. There is a concrete progress that has been achieved through this technocratic wheel rolling. But of course, in this technocratic uh, wheel rolling, the EU is oftentimes, and I would say intentionally so, not having the political instincts, failing to see that something is going str uh, 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 strongly astray in a uh, partner country, that serious reforms are not implemented and this is that it is the passe democracy and again i will probably depart a bit from the eastern partnership region and me uh, mention uh, western Balkan balkans but definitely serbia is one case uh, where this has happened it started off quite well we set the uh, the integration uh, wheel rolling and then we are seeing that the democracy rule of law standards are really deteriorating there I still, I am a supporter of a process, uh, 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 no matter how technocratical or probably this uh, clinically incremental it is, it's definitely better to have this wheel rolling than to stop it because of a problem of uh, increasing authoritarian uh, tendencies of a leader or so. And of course, uh, what we've seen is that uh, this problem of facet dem democracies is not only an illness of Eastern partnership countries, and for that matter, the candidate countries of Western Balkans. I think the best way how it has been captured is actually by a leader of an EU member state, Viktor Orban, when he said that his um, engagement with the European Union has been a peacock's dance in Europe. So he knows how to play it. And then why would we blame leaders of, for instance, Western Balkan countries uh, mentioning Serbia as an example, uh, probably the most visible, but also others, uh, that they engage in the same dance. So you want this technocratic process, we'll keep the uh, wheel rolling, but we will not probably deepen. So I think that the main question of today is really how to deepen the engagement of the European Union with Eastern partnership countries so that the reforms are truly meaningful, so that they become uh, irreversible, so that they are really uh, deep rule of law uh, and uh, uh, anti-corruption related reforms. And this is definitely something where the EU is really struggling. Uh, we are seeing that, of course, the EU is struggling with the issues of security and defense. 
And uh, since it does not have this dimension vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the Eastern uh, uh, partners, not seriously at least, uh, the EU, uh, the, the US is stepping in. Uh, of course, it was uh, a good leeway for the EU not to get engaged in the already uh, mentioned uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia. But of course, given that this is an Eastern partnership uh, block of two countries, the fact that EU did not play any role whatsoever in this conflict is really meaning that um, EU is not really a global player, uh, even uh, as regards to the neighborhood countries. So basically, uh, what I think is really the biggest challenge for the Eastern partnership and neighborhood policy is now how to move beyond this technocratic process. And we were talking about the timing. And uh, uh, Ramones, you very well started off by saying now is not the time, but I agree totally with you that it's actually the time to talk about this. Because obviously, because of the COVID crisis, uh, Russia and China are more than happy to step in and to play a role of global players, of saviors, both in Western Balkans and also Eastern partnership. And my feeling is that now with changed uh, US, the dance with the US between the Eastern partnership countries and, and, and the uh, United States of America presidential administration uh, has been reinvigorated. Uh, there might be new policies in terms of uh, supplying uh, vaccines and so, but the job will have to be done by the EU, nevertheless, in the end, specifically because, of course, the EU has ordered an amount of vaccines that should suffice for vaccination of the uh, population of the EU and also distribution to the neighbors. But unfortunately, the rhetor rhetorical momentum might be lost and uh, EU's uh, uh, partners might start looking both at China and uh, Russia and also the US. So these are just the things that uh, are important to consider not to lose the momentum. So this is, this is it, this concludes my remarks. Thank you very much, Walter. Thank you for, for your insights, especially uh, the technocratic nature of the process, which uh, uh, I think is similar to what Arnold has discussed when he mentioned 20 deliverables with concrete uh, results. That's probably the only way that uh, uh, relations between the EU and its neighbors can progress uh, in, in this global geopolitical environment. And indeed, as you said, uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, one, many people, not just one, <laughs> could uh, probably wondered uh, last autumn when there was a heating up of the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, where the geopolitical European Commission was, or where the EU in general was uh, at that time. Uh, fortunately, we see now some signs of EU uh, activity in the Tbilisi, at least uh, the president of the European Council uh, uh, showed his attention and, and uh, uh, presence uh, in Georgia, but still, of course, uh, geopolitically, EU is uh, slow to act. It's difficult for the EU to act, having in mind uh, the decision-making rules in the foreign security and defense policy issues. And uh, no wonder that technocracy prevails because EU is first of all the single market, which is based on very technical rules that aim at uh, uh, functioning for freedoms, free, free movement of goods, services, people and capital. So inevitably it turns technocratic, but it also has good sides. And, and as you said, this keeps the process going and, and it is important for 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 all sides to have the process going. But uh, I won't start making uh, my own presentation because uh, uh, we have uh, Arkady, uh, I'm sure with many critical insights uh, and in such a way we are uh, moving uh, slowly but fluently from official position to, well, uh, position of former official uh, who is now uh, 
able to have certain distance uh, between the object of discussion and herself and now to to a think tanker who uh, usually has uh, uh, interesting controversial ideas and i'm sure uh, i'm sure he he will this time as well so Arkady Moshes, uh, director of EU Eastern Neighborhood and Russia Research Program at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Arkady, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ramunas. And let me start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to join this distinguished panel this afternoon. And yes, as you rightly guessed, uh, my presentation will be a lot less balanced, a lot less optimistic. And there will be, it will be more, rather, rather black than gray, let alone black than white. Uh, I don't know how to measure the temperature, but I know nevertheless that the patient is in a very bad condition at the moment. And it's then the condition is worsening. If we started the policy in the Eastern neighborhood or Eastern partnership, more than a decade ago with an idea that the, this, this EU's Eastern neighborhood should over time become more secure, more prosperous, more transformed in accordance with the European norms and more resembling an actual region. That if, if these were the premises of the policy, we will probably have to admit that we failed and we didn't go that far. I, I accept what was said about the successes. Uh, that's, that's right, they've been achieved. But I'm very much afraid that successes are more a feature of the past. And in future, more challenges and stronger challenges will be waiting for us. Let me quickly go through the list of um, the features, the characteristic features of the neighborhood at the moment, which everybody knows, but still we need to see them in dynamics, whether we compare them with 2009, 2014, or pre-COVID epoch. Uh, I mean, there are lots of things that should make us to be more concerned than before. In terms of more or less secure neighborhood, we have a war in Ukraine. I've been arguing from day one in 2014 that this conflict would not be frozen, which unfortunately too many people in the EU wanted to achieve. They wanted to freeze the conflict as opposed to resolve it. So it's not frozen. It's not resolved. I don't know if I like the word simmering. As we speak, there is a new phase of escalation in Donbas. If between July and December, we had something which the Ukrainian leaders preferred to call ceasefire. It was not a ceasefire, but the intensity of the war was indeed less. Then in January, February, we definitely see an escalation. Dozens of Ukrainian soldiers die every month. This is anything but a frozen conflict. And we do not have any, an, an idea how to approach it because uh, the situation is what it is. So it's not secure. If we look at the case of Belarus, which I'll be, com we'll, I'll be coming back and back during this presentation, we will have to admit that the level of repress repression and repressiveness of the regime that we saw last year and are seeing now is simply unseen in this country. I might be compared with some other countries in the neighborhood, but probably not. It's, it's unseen in the neighborhood in the post-Soviet space. And the European Union had zero leverage. All these years of handshakes with Mr. Lukashenko, of pompous forums, of, uh, I don't know, initiatives to hold together the ice hockey championship, you name it, of promises of the money, all that played no role in his decision to rely on the thing which he knows best, namely repressions, and not even to think for a split second whether he was going to care about the level of relationship that uh, his country and his diplomacy had achieved with, with the European Union. Th third, the economic situation. I'm not a professional economist, but it would be suffice. It would suffice to say that Ukraine and Moldova, for years, have been competing for a position of Europe's poorest country. And now that the COVID stroke, these countries will be getting poorer at a much quicker pace. At least for two reasons: 
One reason is impossibility to receive remittances. Uh, dozens of billions of US dollars or euros were coming to this country from the guest workers, many of which had to leave the countries in which they used to work. This money is not coming. The macroeconomic situation is, is very challenging in all of these countries. Uh, they cannot borrow at will as the Europeans or the Americans because they cannot, they cannot borrow that much in their national currency and they cannot borrow that much on international markets. And they cannot emit the money the way that we do through qualitative easing and other things. So we should, pre should prepare ourselves for a, that the economic gap between the European Union and its Eastern neighbors will grow considerably. Fourth, uh, and that was already mentioned, reforms and European norms. The region is still the realm of corruption. Even the most advanced countries in terms of their at least alleged Europeanization are still terribly corrupt. Uh, other norms, the rule of law is coming very slowly, is coming at all. I mean, it's again, it's enough to remember the post or electoral or, or turbulence in Georgia or the, the turbulence that was going on there around the election, which has not yet subsided. I mean, and that's the country which was considered to be a champion of Europeanization and uh, judicial reform and bringing the rule of law into the country. And yet we have all the questions. Fifth, uh, again, a, a minor point, but a, a big thing. Uh, we are not getting a cohesive region, a region. There's no cohesion. There are three countries that want uh, to have a relationship of integration with the West. There are two countries which are happy to have a relationship of integration with Russia, Armenia and Belarus. And there is Azerbaijan, which successfully playing a balancing act, but it doesn't, doesn't make the life of either Brussels or Moscow easier. But the intra-regional synergetic effect is not being achieved or advanced, even I would argue. And six, it's the future. And you've already mentioned this, Ramunas. I mean, there's no perspective of integration. And if you now think about the border, yes, it's COVID. You, it, it can be argued that this is not forever, but it's for a long time. And again, poor people who will not be able to pay for the tests and will not be able to cross the borders, even when it becomes possible, will be left somewhere. If that border remains what it is now, a vivid example of a barrier uh, between the EU and non-EU, that's gonna have uh, effects also on the determination of many of the voters in these countries and the way they will vote. They will be seeking for alternatives. I mean, I'm not arguing against the sanitary policies as, as they exist at the moment. I, I realize the need, I understand the need for them, but we also should, should see that uh, the, the time limits that we have cannot be pushed endlessly. And you either bring back the perspective of integration, if not membership, but still some kind of integration between these countries with the European Union, or at some point it will be too late. So from my point of view, the situation is of course extremely challenging. I'm not going to blame the EU for all that. It's not the EU fault by and large, but it's partly the EU fault. What I'm trying to say though, is that unfortunately the European Union some time ago, already well before COVID, admitted that it kind of was not going to reach the goals that it had set in front of itself in 2009 or around that, that period of time. It scaled down its regional, regional ambitions. Uh, it became too sensitive about the Russian policies, policies. It became too soft on conditionality. And instead of transformation, it came up with the agenda, which most of the people in the region cannot even understand. It's the, the, the agenda of resilience and connectivity, which is something completely different. It might be fine technocratically, but mind you, there is no good translation of the word resilience into my native language, into Russian. I mean, when you try to explain what you're trying to achieve by promoting resilience, people will probably not understand what you're talking about. And unfortunately, and this is a very sad irony, 
by promoting the resilience, you promote the resi often promote the resilience of regimes rather than countries. And that's exactly what happened in Belarus. Lukashenko's regime turned out to be extremely resilient uh, in the face of the challenges that, that, that it encountered. But that's not the kind of resilience that, of course, the EU wanted to achieve. But the problem is that this was to be expected. At least I expected that, because when you engage with this type of regimes, when you give them money, when you are weak on conditionality, they use you. They learn how to use you, how to win diplomatically, how to achieve their goals as opposed to yours. And again, it was ideologically wrong for the European Union to give up the transformative agenda it once had and replace it with the agenda of co-ownership or joint ownership of the project. Because, sorry, if you have joint projects with the regime like the kind of Mr. Lukashenko he was building in Belarus, in the end, you're exactly going to get what, you, what you've got. And this this only one possible outcome that comes from that. Uh, does that mean that Russia is, 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 is totally chocolate coated and fully successful? Certainly not. And I agree with what was said, that Russia has not achieved many of its goals either. But Russia achieved something which it considered very important. It achieved basically non-opposed annexation of Crimea. Nobody's talking about that in any serious political terms anymore and hasn't been talking about that ever since. Nobody is talking about EU and NATO enlargement to include these countries, just as Russia wants, wants it to be. Russia has political will, and more often than not, Russia has the, the initiative in its regional policies now, which was not always the case. Again, in 2013, it was the EU and the association agreement which challenged Russia. But since that time, having had its fingers burned, the European Union has never dared to have an ambitious agenda in the region. It was an agenda of conflict dodging. It was an agenda basically combining good and nice looking declarations with the practical realpolitik of engagement with Russia, often on Russia's terms. Uh, it's enough to read the statements of the French president to understand what it is and what it was. It's, it's, this is what is being sought. Selective engagement, dialogue, you name it, Borrell's visits, uh, all in 2021, as if there wasn't enough time to get rid of the illusions. So I would say that if the EU wants uh, to intercept the initiative and to be more successful in the region than it has been so far, it would actually need to revise its, its agenda to make it much more ambitious and much more, unfortunately, ready to stand a geopolitical conflict with Russia. But this is what my recommendation would be. Well, of course, my uh, prediction is that this is not going to happen. We will continue having business as usual. And probably eight years from now, we'll have another 20th anniversary of the Eastern Partnership, which will be as pompous and frankly, as meaningless as the one that we had two years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arkady, for uh, sharp comments as usual. Uh, that should uh, bring in uh, more nuances to our discussion. Uh, thank you for uh, mentioning uh, Belarus a number of times. Uh, I should take this opportunity also to, to tell the audience uh, and our panelists that uh, just a couple of days ago there, there, is a, there was a new study policy brief uh, released by our Latvian colleagues, uh, Latvian Institute of International Affairs, on Baltic and Nordic uh, responses to the last year's crisis in Belarus. I have to disclose I am one of the authors uh, who contributed a Lithuania chapter. And what this study, which includes only Baltic and Nordic countries, uh, uh, which uh, have rather similar views on human rights, on rule of law and so values, uh, what this study shows uh, to me is that even among this group of countries, we saw very different uh, national responses to situation in Belarus. Uh, so if we talk about EU 27 member states, of course, uh, then situation gets even more complicated. And we 
remember well uh, the uh, this uh, this uh, stalemate uh, in August September in the EU when uh, the issue of sanctions towards uh, officials in Belarus was not uh, solved for some time due to one member state in in uh, EU South linking this issue with its own uh, with its own uh, foreign policy concerns. Uh, uh, packaging it together as it is uh, quite usual in the EU, uh, which slowed down significantly EU's reaction to events in Minsk uh, and to this uh, unfortunately uh, very repressive reaction. Um, I just want to ask you, Arkady, what do you think about uh, what Arnold has mentioned, uh, a proposal for single market access as an incentive uh, for Eastern partnership uh, countries, uh, of course, provided that EU member states agree among themselves uh, on, on steps uh, towards this. Um, what do you think? Uh, is this not only uh, feasible but attractive or maybe it's even not feasible according to your analysis uh first of all i think it would be a good idea if this proposal is 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 done seriously if the countries in the region know that this is what the eu actually means and that if they do it they'll get it so that it should not be the, the proposal of the kind of the one that Ukraine and Georgia received after the Bucharest NATO summit. That one day you will be in NATO members. When this one day comes, nobody knows. But of course, feasibility is another story. And attractiveness as of the moment is another story. I'd say that if this proposal was made five years ago, it would have had a much larger uh, lobbying power, let me, let me put it that way. Uh, now it would be much more dif difficult to benefit from. I, I would still do it. I would still seriously consider and go forward with it. Of course, it won't, not all six countries can benefit from it. We are probably talking about one or two. And we are talking about the time frame of 20 years at least. And uh, even if it's made uh, and if it's serious, the issues that I was talking about would still need to be tackled well before then. But as such, it's a, it's a positive thing. Thank you. We also have questions coming from the audience. And actually, the first question is quite similar to the one I just asked, but uh, uh, somewhat broader. And it is directed also to Arkady. What can the EU do to be taken more seriously in the neighborhood, especially in the eastern part? So we discuss. We sorry, we discussed the prospect of the single market, uh, but maybe you have some other uh, instruments in mind that you could use, especially in those countries which do not seriously think about uh, being part of the single market of the EU or are not able to do that? This is a difficult question because, as I said, a lot of time was lost. I actually like the old mantras here, more for more, less for less, uh, nothing for nothing. Do not be afraid that not all six countries will come to your next summit. If, if you have, don't, don't be afraid to spoil the relationship with some of them and with some leaders and with some regimes. Look for uh, success stories where you can find them. Uh, and so kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's not that difficult from a technocratic approach, but it just has to be much faster than, than, than what we had done. Do not engage with the regime which, which do not behave the way you would want them to behave. 
because then you you will have bad relations with the regimes, but you have good relations with the people who oppose these regimes. Who in, again, the Belarusian case shows exactly that, that by engaging with the regime of Lukashenko, uh, the EU lost the soft power it's once had in Belarus. In 2010, as you mentioned, there were EU, EU flags on that, on the square. In 2020, there were no because the people who oppose Lukashenko are at the same time so much frustrated with the engagement between the EU and, and Lukashenko that they don't see the point and uh, have a different Russia policy. I mean, it will not be possible to avoid conflicts with Russia. It will not be possible. And uh, you need to be prepared that every once in a while you will be engaged not only into dialects and Nord Stream 2s, but into conflicts with Russia. Uh, if Russia itself will learn to treat you more seriously than it is doing now, if you're ready to speak in one voice and if necessary, in a tough voice. But again, I mean, I can go on endlessly, but this is as of the moment wishful thinking. The reality is that you is not speaking in one voice, uh, is not ready to go into geop geopolitical clashes with Russia for, for different reasons is much more happy to do deals with Moscow as it was in Moldova two years ago. The deal, by the way, lasted six months and the pro-European government was out of power. And uh, this, is, this is what it is. We will, we will soon know more. I mean, in 10 days, EU will present us probably with new agreement on what its policy on Russia should be. Uh, but as for now, unfortunately, uh, I don't want to be, to, be, to be flying in the skies. I, I'm, 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 I have my both legs on the ground. And the reality is that this, whatever I say now doesn't matter. Thank you. The other question I think uh, goes to both Arnoldus and Lolita. It is uh, the following one. What would be the most important Baltic interests in the ENP, in European neighborhood uh, uh, policies? So. Uh, Baltic uh, uh, or Lithuanian or Latvian, so it's up to you how you would uh, answer. Let's start with Arnoldas, please. Thank you, Ramune. Well, I think you know uh, there are many interests, but uh, the two that I that I think of first of all, this is a chance for us as Baltic states, uh, having had ourselves a very successful, uh, you know, uh, experience of EU uh, membership uh, the last 17 years and of transformation within our societies to share our experience for the field. So it's in many ways a historical legacy for the Baltic states to engage with Eastern partnership. It, it, it really is, 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 is our history, moment of history. Um, and uh, so also uh, important for our own populations to feel more confident of themselves, to understand the, the progress they've achieved. And that is always extremely visible when, when, when one travels you know, to Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and talks to people, engages with the societies and understands you know, what we have and what people are still striving there for. So this is one, one I think, uh, very important uh, aspect of it. Another one, of course, it has always been and will be our interest to have a a much more, uh, um, you know, present uh, European Union in the region, a much more united European Union in the region, and, and much more engaged in European Union in the, in the region. We, we might always be a bit more ambitious than uh, the reality will be, but this is our role as well, you know, in terms of uh, shaping uh, uh, policy within the EU. And it always works like this, you know, uh, while, while listening to your just uh, uh, now discussion with Arkady, you know, one has to Remember that the European Union is not one member state, it's not one country, it's not a global policeman, it's neither a kindergarten uh, teacher, uh, you know, responsible for everything that uh, one or the other kid uh, does wrong. Uh, it is uh, 27 member states. And perhaps for those who believe in European Union or believe in the European idea, it would be, uh, you know, uh, a wish to see at some point uh, uh, EU forum uh, policy as a collective of 27. But unfortunately, in terms of foreign policy, often we see EU foreign policy as an additional one to the 27 that already exist. Uh, and that is the biggest challenge. 
And it is a really big, big difference from internal EU decision-making uh, in areas of uh, environment, transport, energy, uh, competition elsewhere, where we are perfectly united, perfectly effective, uh, sometimes technocratic, sometimes political, but we are a power. Uh, and here, indeed, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's not so easy. But let's not forget the EU's construction has been around uh, only, you know, uh, since the Rome Treaty. It's still extremely young project in the course of world's history. Thank you, Arnoldos, for your uh, always present optimism and enthusiasm. Uh, Lolita, what would be your answer uh, regarding Baltic or Latvian interests uh, in ENP? Um, I think that uh, the prime interest uh, of Latvia, and for that matter, I think in uh, general, our region, is of course to be active, vocal, and pragmatic players in the European Union so that we can strengthen and develop this policy. I think this to a large extent already has been the making of uh, the Scandinavian and Baltic and some other EU member states. And it's obviously so because we are regionally interested. So we have to use all levers possible to make this policy stronger on behalf of the European Union. And of course, in that context, if we are thinking about how the EU could respond better, uh, my uh, first, uh, uh, first thought is that uh, we as Latvia and we as, as the Baltics, of course, would, would want the EU to have better instincts, better political instincts, whom to support, when to move, where to move, not to have this blind, approach uh, of, 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 of the machine that is just going ahead. Because uh, usage of instincts could have changed uh, uh, and could have uh, improved many situations in the past. And uh, again, I will uh, uh, mention an example outside the Eastern Partnership region, but if we are thinking about uh, the North Macedonia, this is when one place where the EU lacked any instincts whatsoever and almost messed it up. And there have been many instances from Eastern Partnership where we can say this, have better instincts and move quicker. Uh, because uh, we know uh, uh, when we were building up our own uh, independence economies and also our own bids uh, for the European Union and NATO, uh, we knew that we had to move very quickly. We had to capture all opportunities. And to be able to capture this, uh, these opportunities, uh, there is a need for leadership. And actually, currently, I'm personally really afraid what is going to happen uh, if that really is the case uh, that Germany is having a different chancellor after September uh, uh, 2021 Bundestag elections, who is going to have this leadership? Because obviously, as we've seen, uh, uh, after this visit in uh, Borrell's visit in Moscow, in terms of high representative, we do not have this instinct and ability to move quickly at the present time. Thank you, Oleta. When you were speaking about instinct, I remembered uh, another recent controversial idea proposed by the European Commission regarding control of exports of vaccines uh, to the UK, uh, which seemed like somewhat insensitive, having in mind uh, Irish, Northern Ir Irish border. Uh, and I think that there was a case of uh, lack of appropriate political instinct. Uh, though when you speak about the speed of reaction, uh, moving fast, uh, I guess that in many cases, it's not so much EU institutions, but disagreements among member states, which prevent fast, uh, fast joint reaction of, of the EU 27. And we have another question, which I think uh, is uh, relevant to all our panelists. Uh, and some of you already mentioned uh, the topic of China and Russia vaccine diplomacy. 
The question is, should Europe follow suit and would it help establish influence in the neighborhood? I assume uh, would pursuing similar vaccine diplomacy as Russia and China uh, are doing, uh, would it help to increase EU's influence in its neighborhood? Uh, I will now start in the reverse order. Arkady, what would your response be? That's not the reverse order, I'm first again. But uh, I, I don't have a real position on that. Because frankly, first of all, I am not sure that Russia and China have already reached a lot in terms of soft power through their vaccine diplomacy. I mean, Ukraine doesn't take it, and that's where it matters most. Um, China, and China, I mean, it has such a versatile policy of building up its economic and software leverage that one more component, adding it or taking it away, will not be critical for the continuing rise of China. On the other hand, we have the position of the United States, which basically said our own citizens first. And frankly, uh, here you are on a very thin ice because facing the situation that the EU is facing, that its leverage, forget about Lukashenko, is not enough to be persuasive for its own pharmaceutical companies to make them deliver upon what they promised. When it's mid-March and the countries that are leaders in terms of vaccinations are still below 10%, compare them with Britain, compare them with Israel. Uh, I am not sure that if uh, kind of you start, if you start spreading significant amounts of vaccine outside of your borders before your citizens are vaccinated, that it will, it will work for you politically. And if you start spreading small amounts of vaccine, it will, it will still not be like inside, but it will be probably ridiculed outside. So as I said, not a very strong position, but I have my doubts. I think there are other instruments through which you can achieve more. Thank you, Arkady. Uh, Lolita, what would be your take on this? Uh, on this, I would actually disagree with Arkady. I would say that um, the vaccine diplomacy would be a very, very powerful uh, tool currently if it was a possible or available tool. And unfortunately, I believe that uh, all of this, all of us realize that it will be a powerful tool, but only after a certain time. And this time lapse is really irritating. And I think it gets on really so many people's uh, nerves because it's obvious that by the end of this year, most likely the EU will be able to be an a serious uh, uh, vaccine diplomacy player because there will just be enough, but currently it cannot. And this is the crucial difference between uh, uh, China and Russia and the EU. We are democratic societies. We need to vaccinate our people first. And this is just inevitability of this whole uh, uh, commissioning, creation and production uh, process that we'll have to wait. And uh, of course, on behalf of Ukraine, it was extremely courageous and uh, a very honorable gesture to say that they will not accept Sputnik V. But obviously, in terms of where they are looking now, most likely they will be looking at the United States. Once they've done, achieved uh, uh, sufficient levels of vaccination, most likely there is going to be a bilateral vaccine diplomacy from the US, at least the initial, and then the EU most likely will step in, probably supply even more, but who will care then? And this is the peril of the current situation. But I do believe that it's an extremely important tool. And uh, it's very good that at least there is this me mechanism of COVAX. So there is at least some mechanism of sharing. Thank you, Arnolde. Well, Lithuania was uh, the member state that initiated uh, this letter of 13 
foreign ministers uh, uh, early on this year uh, to the commission uh, uh, really uh, arguing for creating this uh, sharing uh, mechanism of vaccines uh, for Eastern partners and Southern partners as well, for all of our neighbors. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, the commission has responded positively and, and they, 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 they have um, came up with this uh, mechanism uh, also through Team Europe approach. So we are very much supporting this idea. We think it's very important uh, contribution of the of, of European member states in uh, this battle of narratives that Russia and China are engaging in. Uh, clearly, not only in Eastern Partnership region, but also in the member states themselves. And we've seen quite uh, uh, you know a few examples, whether Hungary or Slovakia or other countries. So uh, here um, it's a matter uh, indeed not only uh, of, of credibility, but also a matter of uh, unitarian nature of the EU um, to help the neighbors. And yes, if at the moment it's very difficult due to rather scarce uh, supply in the EU itself, uh, this will improve uh, uh, sooner or later. Uh, at the moment, uh, about 60 million uh, vaccines have been uh, uh, delivered to the EU member states, uh, around um, 40 plus million administered. That's still very little. But uh, if uh, uh, the companies continue meeting their contract obligations, and that was the biggest problem in fact, uh, and if uh, the plans uh, uh, in increasing uh, 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 production capacities will, will materialize, and the European countries have been working very hard on that, uh, we should see much bigger numbers coming in uh, in April, May, and June. Now with Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, also uh, approved yesterday, uh, by European medical agencies. So, you know, uh, uh, this will uh, happen. Uh, but uh, as Lolita has very well said, uh, the timing is the issue. Um, and, and we should all be reminded that it shouldn't be seen really as a race between countries. It should be seen as race against time. Time is, is offensive, of essence here. Thank you, Arnold. Indeed, I was waiting if someone is going to mention the initiatives uh, of, of Lithuania and other Baltic states to, to uh, provide assistance to Eastern partners in this area, uh, which uh, started uh, last spring, actually, before even vaccines were produced with, with various other efforts. But of course, as Lolita said, and I totally agree, in democratic societies, uh, policymakers also are expected to think, first of all, about their citizens. And uh, I, I watched how our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Gabriel Svansberg, was questioned in uh, Kiev, and well, how he had to respond uh, that we are also now uh, uh, having too little to be able to supply our partners in the East uh, because we are vaccinating domestically and still have quite a lot to do. So that's that's the issue, as you said. Well, we only have two minutes left uh, and uh, I would still like to give an opportunity for a very short final comment to each of our panelists. Uh, so. Again, I will start with Arkady, very uh, short final remark when you think about the topic of our today's panel. What would be your key message? The situation is bad enough and we should understand the strength and the volume of the challenge uh, and get prepared for even tougher times. I share everything that was said about the importance of the technocratic approach. But saying that, I would also like to add that without political ownership of the, of the policy, the policy will not do. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Lolita. What would be your concluding thought? Um, I would say that um... Uh, it, it goes without saying that we are definitely much better off with having Eastern partnership and neighborhood policy that, than not having one. 
and uh, uh, definitely the Baltic states and also the Scandinavian country, uh, countries where we can build alliances. And this uh, uh, letter of uh, 16 foreign ministers is a very good example. This is basically our mission. This is our predicament. We will have to continue talking about Eastern partnership countries, talking, 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 talking. We will have to continue talking about Belarus. We will have to continue supporting Belarus bilaterally and also at the EU level. It's just our predicament. And partly it is really, uh, I see it even as a mission, as a uh, paying back for what we have received in terms of our own economic and democratic consolidation from the EU accession process. So we can't be selfish about it. Uh, we can't just keep it for ourselves. We need to share. And this is, uh, this is what we'll have to continue doing. Thank you very much. And Arnoldi, the last word is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Ramoni. Well, I believe, you know, uh, whilst uh, pessimism and skepticism, uh, uh, one can afford in academic uh, discussion, and in fact, it probably is very necessary even in an academic world, uh, uh, one cannot afford it in policymaking and diplomacy. You know, you have to believe your idea and, and, and your, and your uh, objective. So, what I would like to wish the policymakers across Europe is not to lose that belief. This is not uh, the time to retreat from Eastern Partnership region, but actually to engage. This is not uh, the time to, uh, you know, to be fatigued, but rather to re-energize ourselves. Uh, it is uh, also the time to really get armed with very you know, uh, long-term patience, of which we will be of need. Uh, and uh, also a very good time for the Baltic states, not only to be a constant reminder, a constant teller of the inconvenient truth, but also perhaps a source of ideas that people lack. This is the time to bring a bit more substance to the policy as we approach uh, uh, the summit later this year. Thank you very much. Uh, with this, I would like to thank all three excellent uh, panelists again. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed uh, our discussion and I hope audience did as well. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, the audience, uh, uh, those who listened and who especially those who sent their questions. I would like to thank my colleagues uh, at the Institute of International Relations and Political Science of Vilnius University who arranged uh, the technical uh, part of this uh, panel. Uh, I should remind that the conference uh, uh, Baltic EU Conversations 2021 will continue and uh, please uh, uh, continue to follow the general uh, session that will resume soon. And uh, that concludes our panel. Once again, thank you all. Have a nice day and have a nice weekend. Bye.